Hey, this is Voxide, and if you want to learn Houdini, you can check out my in-depth courses, link will be in the description. Hey, so I wanted to make a video which covers the common fracturing methods and uh, my preferred uh, ways to fracture stuff. So I prepared some examples here and we will be recreating all of these from scratch and we will start from simple and then we will keep adding complexity and then combining methods and hopefully by the end of this video you will have a better understanding of fracturing and ways to come up with your own uh, fracturing method. And don't worry about this looking like a lot of work, uh, a lot of these are just copy pasting notes so here I copy pasted some of these and copy pasted them here and I just added a few extra notes so this looks a little bit more complex than it is. I will be mostly covering fractures for concrete and uh, glass and unfortunately I haven't had much practice uh, fracturing wood but I think the RBD material fracture does a pretty good job for uh, wood so you should be able to use that. Speaking of which, let's talk a little bit about the RBD material fracture. So the RBD material fracture is pretty good for a lot of cases but the only problem with it is that usually it's really slow and when you want to add when you really work with a lot of pieces then it starts to get really slow and the response time for it is uh, really slow when you want to make the slightest changes to it so whenever you want to add a little bit more noise or add some extra pieces and stuff like that I think it has to it has to rebake everything so it really feels kind of bad and slow and clunky to work with so usually in my projects I rarely find myself using the RBD material fracture that much but with that being said it's still a very good tool of fracturing so if you don't want to set up a large network of nodes like this and you just want to do some R&D on an idea or something then maybe you can just use the RBD material fracture to get your ideas out quickly but hopefully with all of these methods I will give you an alternative solution to the RMT material fracture and hopefully you will find at least some of these techniques uh, useful to keep in your uh, pocket. So that's all I wanted to say about the RMT material fracture. It's really good, uh, you should keep it around, but this is Houdini and we like to create our own custom tools. We will get started right away with the first examples, which is the simplest example and I have here a grid. So this is just a simple grid with subdivisions and uh, we add a mountain node to it. So just an attribute noise for the position and then we do an extrude volume to give this, uh, to give this some thickness. And let's say that this would be the terrain that we receive from the client and create some pieces from this. So this will be our terrain and I will control C to copy this and we will recreate all of this maybe down here. And I will do an object merge and just merge this here. So we start on our chain over here. So if you want to inspect this project file, I will leave the link for you to be able to download this in the description. So definitely check this out and download this and go through all of the nodes yourself if you want to. So let's start with the first example and probably the simplest method to fracture something is going to be the Voronoi method. So in order to do this, we will need to have some uh, points that are, uh, that are scattered throughout the geometry. So from this object merge, let's first uh, create a volume from this. So I will do VDB from polygons and we want to create a density volume so that we scatter points inside the geometry as well. So we'll do a scatter and I'll get rid of my grid view here. So these are the points. Let's uh, undo relax iteration and let's scatter maybe 100 or so. And then we can just simply drop down a Voronoi fracture, place this uh, the points in our second input here. And if I preview this, we have our pieces and this will be just the simple Voronoi method. And if I do an exploded view from here, we can inspect our pieces and we can see what happens here. So this is the simplest method and the fastest one, but you can see that our pieces, uh, they are really cut straight here and we don't have uh, really any resolution on the inside part of our pieces. So this is the problem with the Voronoi. And uh, so this will be the first example. This is just a simple Voronoi. And what people usually do to fix this uh, problem here with having a straight interior without any detail is if I grab this and I copy this over, let's go ahead and after this object merge, I'll drop down a null actually, just to keep things a little bit clean. And what people usually do here is we record their position as they are right now. So we will drop down a rest and then you would add a noise to this surface. So let's drop down a mountain for this. 
and uh, for this I will turn off noise along vector and we might want to increase the element size or maybe decrease the amplitude Okay, so we noise up our source geometry and then we do our scatter and fracturing to this noised up version. Okay, so we still see that we have the straight pieces here and I'll put this over to the side. But now what we can do is if I drop down another rest uh, node and instead of the mode store rest, we set this to swap rest, this will now force our points into their original position which we stored here. So when we force the points back in their position, this will also alter our cuts that we created. So we sort of add this uh, mountain noise to our piece border. So we can see that as I disable this mountain node, we have the straight version. And when I enable this, now we have this detail on our pieces. So we can do an exploded view from here to see this. And we can see that even though the interior is still straight, we have detail on sort of like the border of the pieces. And if we compare it to, uh, to this, we can see here that the lines are straight and now we have noise on our geometry. So this will give us some shading issues and we can also go to our rest, to our original rest and we can also store the normals. And uh, when we go back to our rest, we can do the uh, add normals so this will give us our original normals and by default i'm using the visualizer for the name so in the voronoi fracture you can click on this icon here and this will create a visualizer but this is how it looks and we can already see these artifacts on our geometry and this is the main problem with doing this technique with the noise and the and the rest and the swapping of the rest attribute is we end up with some pieces that look like this and if I go in my exploded view we can see that this is the problem here that because this interior surface is straight and it doesn't have resolution some of these polygons will protrude our surface geometry so this is the main problem with this technique and we can see this happening over here we have this interior polygon protruding our surface polygons. So this technique uh, only works really with some sort of, uh, with some specific geometry and, and the kind of geometry that I'm talking about is really if we have like a street or something that's straight, so not like this. We can see here that we have a lot of noise in this geometry. So if for example, I would just do a box instead. So let's drop down a box and let's make this roughly the same size as our terrain. So I'll just scale this up and then just scale this down maybe do something like this. So if I had this box and we will need some resolution for this box. So let's press Shift W and I'll just increase the subdivisions here. Or maybe uh, it's uh, easier if I just do a remesh. So we have consistent topology. We have a uh, topology now and we will store our rest. We will do our mountain noise. All right, and let's go to our exploded view. So this will be the result. And we still have a little bit of this problem and we can also mitigate this problem if we go to the mountain noise and instead of doing the noise in all of the three directions, let's split this up. So let's click this XYZ icon over here and I just want noise in the X and the Z direction. So I will set this Y value here, the middle one to zero. Okay, so we only noise in the X and Y directions. So now if I go to my rest, to the result of this fracture, this will be the result. So we still have a little bit of this problem. If I go to my exploded view, we can see that maybe for this piece over here, we end up with slivers of geometry, which looks like this which might not be that noticeable and also we can maybe scale down this noise so I can drop the amplitude down to maybe 0 0.5 to help with uh, getting rid of this effect. So now we can see that we are starting to get uh, pieces that are uh, sort of okay. So then from here to add more detail to the inside uh, geometry, we can go ahead and after the rest, we can do a remesh. So let's actually go to the exploded view and let's drop down a remesh. And we only want the group to be the inside group. And this inside group is given to us by default inside this Voronoi fracture stop. So if I turn on the remesh now, we should see geometry on uh, this uh, interior side here. So let's just give this a second. 
So now we have resolution on the inside and from here I can do an RBD interior detail. So uh, let's turn off the detail size. We don't need this because we already have resolution. So let's go ahead and we might want to increase the interior cusp angle. And then if I increase this noise amplitude, we can see that this is just a noise which has this fading attribute for the amplitude. All right, and then uh, we and then you can just add some noise and you can increase the frequency and stuff like that. So now we have some detail on the inside as well. And from here, we might want to drop another normal node, which is only on the outside group, just to fix some of these weird uh, shading issues here on the border. All right, so we end up with pieces that look like this. So this is pretty good and uh, we don't really see a lot of shading issues. So you could definitely work with something like this. Uh, let's go back maybe and let's replace it with our terrain. So instead of the box, let's use the terrain and let's see if this holds up. All right, and if I take a look, this is actually... We don't really see a lot of problems with this. Let's maybe get rid of this exploded view here and run all of these nodes on just our pieces in their initial position. So I'll get rid of this exploded view. And let's see if we get our uh, original terrain back. Okay, so this is working pretty fine. We can see some bits and pieces over here, but I really don't think this will make a really big difference in the overall result and if I do an exploded view from here but if we inspect the pieces I have a feeling that we might find some of those weird protruding geometry uh, stuff that we mentioned earlier but uh, unfortunately at this moment I can't find any so this is one of the old school techniques uh, where you can use Voronoi to create your fracturing and also introduce some detail. So you can see that this is pretty good and it's pretty fast, but I will show you an even better method to use the Voronoi technique. So let's go ahead and let's grab this object merge and bring it over here, bring our terrain here. And before we move on to the new Voronoi uh, technique, let's actually cover the Boolean fracture first. So when it comes down to it, you really have only two options for fracturing. You either uh, scatter a bunch of uh, points inside the geometry and do a Voronoi fracture, or you create cutter objects to use to slice up your geometry using the Boolean fracture. And let's talk a little bit about the Boolean fracture now. So for this, we will also drop down a null from here and we want to scatter a bunch of points in this geometry. So let's also do a VDB from polygons and turn this into a density field. And then I'll drop a scatter from here, disable relaxed iterations and let's just scatter maybe 25 points. And we want to copy some geometry onto these points. And what people usually prefer for this is going to be a simple grid. So I'll just drop down a grid and we have to make sure that this grid is at least larger than our terrain. So let's preview our terrain and we can see that we need to increase the size of this grid. And usually a starting point for the size of this grid is going to be roughly two times or three times bigger than the object that you want to cut. So I'll just increase this maybe to, let's do 76. All right, let's keep the topology as it is for now. And for the scatter points, let's uh, assign some random normals for this. So let's do an attribute randomize and we will set attribute name N and we want uh, inside sphere. So uh, let's untemplate this geometry. And if I turn on my normal display, we can see that all of these points have random directions for the normal. So when we do a copy to points, let's grab our geometry to copy. So this will be our plane. Let's grab the grid, place it as our geometry to copy and template points will be our points and we end up with something like this. All right, so let's keep this as it is for now and let's just drop down a Boolean fracture from here and the geometry will be solid and the cutting geometry will be a surface since we are using just a grid with no thickness. So you have to keep these settings in, into account when you're doing the Boolean fracture and I'll place this as my second input and let's go ahead and see what happens. So we can see that this is really fast and if I turn on my name display, this will be the result. And if I do an exploded view, 
let's take a look and see what we get. So we have all of these planes intersecting and then through their intersection we are creating pieces where they slice through our terrain geometry. So we end up with something like this and maybe just for example purposes here let's uh, reduce the force count to maybe 10. So have a uh, fewer planes here and now I can go ahead and for this scatter I can play around with the global seed. So I'll use my scroll wheel for this and we can experiment until we get a more interesting shape here. All right. So we end up with something like this. So we can see that we run into the same problem with our Voronoi in which these pieces are straight. And what we can do to fix this now is we can actually alter the cutter surface. So we can grab this grid and we can add more rows and columns so we can increase the resolution for this. And if I drop down a mountain node from here and add some uh, displacement to this. So let's turn off noise along geometry, increase the element size and increase maybe the amplitude and mess around with the settings a little bit and maybe I can also go to the fractal increase the roughness if I go to the capital points now we have this noise on all of our surfaces and now if I do the boolean fracture we should see this in our cutting as well so when we do the exploded view we can see that we end up with a lot of detail uh, on the borders of our pieces but also inside the pieces as well. So the amount of resolution you will have on the interior side, on the inside uh, group here for the polygons will directly depend on how much geometry your cutter objects have. So if I were to go to this copy two points and press E to template this we can see, uh, let's maybe decrease this exploded view a little bit. So we can see here that this resolution on our cutting surface is what's going to propagate over our inside uh, surfaces here. So if I go to this grid and if I increase the rows and columns to 200 and 200, we should now have uh, twice as much polygons on the inside of our pieces. Let's untemplate this and explode this a little bit more so we can see now that we have double the amount on the inside faces here and of course this doesn't look that great because we need to add a normal node so we can drop down a normal and we can set this to be only on the inside and increase the cusp angle so now we should have uh, smooth shaded polygons here so we can see that with this method we get a lot of variation in our size and also in the shapes and also this uh, automatically gives us this interior detail for the inside polygons for each piece. So this is a very legit method to create your uh, pieces. Now we end up with a lot of uh, pieces that look kind of like this uh, big green one over here which kind of looks a little weird. And uh, this, uh, this is fixed if you just increase the scatter amount. So if you add uh, a little bit more cutter objects, so if I increase this to 20, then the chances of this piece being sliced up into further pieces are even more. So we end up with smaller pieces overall and uh, a lot more detail. So uh, we can see that we are really starting to have a lot of crazy detail over here. And maybe the noise on this grid is a little bit too much, but Hopefully this is uh, this will give you a, a good idea of how this boolean fracture method will work. And we can control a little bit more how these cutter objects are aligned. So currently we can see if I go to this they have a completely random direction. But maybe a better idea for this would be for them to be straight and only rotate them in a straight uh, direction. So let me show you what I mean by this. Let's maybe disable the mountain for now so we only preview our planes. And let's disable this attribute randomize for now just for a second. And let's go ahead and after the scatter let's do an attribute vop and create a custom normal for this. Let's uh, dive inside this attribute vop and I'll just drop down a parameter. And I will rename this to dir for direction and plug this into our n. And let's make sure that this is a tree floats. So now if I go up, let's maybe make our normal point straight up. So let's do 0, 1 and 0. And we can preview this here. And now if I go to my copy two points, all of our planes are uh, aligned vertically. Alright, so now to, uh, to introduce some rotation for these planes, we can use 
the up vector for this. So let's go inside, back inside this attribute vop where we have our n, and let's create a random attribute for the up. So let's uh, grab the ptnum and let's drop down a random node and this will be a one integer 3d vector so we want to output a 3d vector and in order for this to be random in all directions we have to do a fit here and we want this value to go from 0 to 1 to negative uh, 1 and 1. So we have to do this extra fit step when we are working with vector to get a uh, random vector. Uh, and if I do a bind export and we want to export this to a tree floats and we will name this up and let's maybe go ahead. So I already have a visualizer for this and this will be the vector. So it's pointing in all random directions, but we really only want this to point in random direction on the X and Z dimensions. So from here, I will just scale this down on the Y. So I'll drop down a multiply. Let's promote the second input to a constant. Let's use three floats here and we'll do one, zero and one. So now we can see that with this multiply, we just scale this down uh, in the Y direction here. So we will also do a normalize from here and now this will be our our planes will be aligned uh, vertically and then they will be rotated based on this uh, up vector so if i go up let's disable the visualizer let's look at our planes so for some reason this uh, direction parameter here got reset so let's make sure that our normals uh, if we look at our normal display, we have no normal here so we have to set this to 0, 1 and 0 so they will point straight up uh, all right, so now if we go to the copy to points, they are all aligned straight up and then they will have random rotation based on this up uh, vector. Uh, furthermore, we can re-enable this attribute randomize and instead of using the operation to set value, we will do add value and we will just decrease this, this uh, global scale here a little bit. So if I set this to zero, they will go, they will point straight up, but we just want to increase this a little bit so we want them to have a just a slight slope to introduce just a little bit more randomness the randomness so if I go now to my exploded view we can see that we I end up with a more uh, cleaner result so this alignment for our cutting surface works a little bit better for terrain in my opinion let's maybe set the, the scatter amount to maybe 10 all right, and let's bring in our uh, noise for the grid. So let's uh, re-enable this node. And this will be the result. So we can see that we really have a lot of interesting detail and a lot of size variation in our pieces. So this is a great way to fracture stuff. So with this method, there are a few considerations to take into account when you are uh, doing the boolean fracture so the first one is and i'll demonstrate this with uh, another example here so i'll drop down a box and uh, i'll just scale this up let's scale this down to 10 and uh, make this smaller so let's maybe uh, replicate let's maybe imitate something like a terrain and we will use just a simple grid for this and let's maybe preview this grid and use another directions for this okay so let's make sure that this uh, is bigger than our uh, plane so i'll increase the size here and let's do a boolean fracture just with these two objects okay so we can see that this works as expected and the problem that occurs with the boolean fracture is when our cutters are not completely covering our geometry so if i were to turn down the size here we can see that when the size is smaller than the geometry that is trying to cut, this is now no longer cutting the geometry and we end up with something that uh, if I press Shift W to view the wireframe, we end up with this weird artifact here from where the cutter is. So this is something that you usually want to avoid. So you always have to make sure that the cutter surface is going through the whole geometry. So you want to make sure that your cutter objects are big enough. Otherwise, you end up with geometry like this and it's going to be kind of messy and uh, it's going to break when you try to do some recursive fracturing after your uh, initial fracture. So this is something you want to avoid and maybe I can demonstrate this here. If I were to go to my grid and make this uh, smaller, 
let's maybe see our result now and we should start to see some of the pieces which uh, look a little bit weird. Uh, we can see that this kind of works. But if we look at the geometry, we can see right over here, we can see that this line, our cutter object wasn't able to reach uh, throughout the whole surface here. So we can see that this is where, it's, where it ends and we end up with messy geometry, which looks like this. So if I were, if I wanted to make some further fracturing only to this piece like later down the chain this would give us a lot of problems so we, we have to make sure that the geometry completely protrudes our our cutter geometry completely protrudes our geometry that we are trying to cut so this is one of the considerations you always want to make sure that the geometry is big enough let's go back to our grid and let's increase this uh, now there's a second problem which arises if I go to this copy two points and look at my geometry Let's maybe press E to template this and look at our terrain. We can see really that uh, it's probably big enough now to protrude the entire geometry but one thing that happens is if we look at our cutter, the Boolean fracture stop will also compute the intersections of the plane them of the planes themselves right over here. So since our geometry is all the way over here, we really are not interested with what happens with the planes uh, outside of the realms of our uh, geometry. So we really only want this cutter object all of the time, like a hundred percent of the time, to be just a little bit bigger than our geometry. So what we can do from here is we can actually go from this null, let's generate a bounds. So this will encapsulate our geometry in a simple box and we will just increase the lower padding, maybe just a bit, one, one and one and do some upper padding as well. And we can now make a selection for our cutter object based on these bounds. So let's from this copy to points, I will place down a group node and let's set this to points. Let's enable keeping bounding regions and use bounding object and place the bounds as our uh, object here. Okay, so we have a selection that's right around our geometry and let's rename this group to to delete and then I'll drop down a blast and I will select this to delete group and I will just simply uh, check this delete non selected so we should then end up with geometry that's right only outside of our uh, terrain so maybe we can preview it like this so this is only the surface that we are interested in so if I were to disable this we can see that all of these parts outside of the geometry here, we really don't need this and this will really slow down our Boolean fracture. So when I go to the Boolean fracture now, we see that this is super fast and we have the exact same result. So this is just another consideration. You always want to make sure that uh, your cutter object is uh, big enough to intersect the entire geometry, but outside of the geometry doesn't really need to be that big. So you can use any culling method that you want to get rid of the geometry that's way outside of the extents of uh, your object. And finally, for concrete specifically, we can add uh, some more pieces here so we can add grout between each of these fractured pieces which is really just pieces that's uh, pieces that are right along these cuts by duplicating our cutter object so our grid if from this grid I do a copy and uh, transform so this will make two copies of this grid and right now we can see this because they are right on top of each other, but we can now use a connectivity node. So let's drop down a connectivity and by default, this will assign to each of this grid a class value. So if I go to the geometry sp spreadsheet, half of these points should be zero and the other half is going to be one. So our initial grid is going to have a class value of zero and our copy will have a class value of one. So now if I go in this mountain node and we go to our noise pattern here we can turn on use of expression and we can use an expression here for the offset so we can type here offset equals to and i will just use this uh, at class value that we just created and now our second copy will have a different offset from our original copy so when i press enter here we can see 
that we have two planes here that are uh, intersecting. So if I turn off the copy, hopefully you can tell now that these are two planes with uh, two different offsets for the noise and we can increase this difference by multiplying this class value. So maybe I can set this uh, multiply by five just to make sure that there is enough offset between these two planes. So when we do our copy to points and our blast, let's take a look and we can see that we have a lot of intersecting planes here. So as a result, when we do our Boolean fracture, let's just preview directly our exploded view. We have all of these pieces, all of these extra pieces that, that are uh, right along our fractured uh, side. So right between all of these big pieces, we will have a lot of small pieces, which will create a lot more natural looking uh, fractures. And we can even increase this even further if I copy another one, if I do a total number here of three, now we should have uh, even more pieces along the cracks here. So maybe I'll do four to illustrate this further. All right, so now we can see that we have a lot of pieces in between each large uh, island. So this is how you can do the grout for the specifically for the terrain, but this can work uh, for other objects as well. All right, so with this we covered the Boolean fracture. So let's encapsulate this, and I'll go ahead copy this over here. So this will be Boolean. So this will work well for a lot of cases. But we can see here that we have uh, rather inconsistent sizes between all of these fractures. So we have this really big piece here, and then we have some medium pieces and a lot of small pieces. So uh, usually we might want a more consistent or rather but predictable uh, result. So my preferred method of doing fracturing is going to be combining the Voronoi and the Boolean workflow. So let's go ahead and let's grab this object merge. Let's bring the terrain over here. So let me show you the way I prefer doing the Voronoi fracturing. So we will start off as the simple Voronoi method. So let's drop down a null here and we want to do a VDB from uh, polygons and do a fog VDB and just scatter points, relax iterations, turn off and just scatter maybe 30 points and let's just do a simple Voronoi fracture from here. So we end up with pieces that look like this and let's maybe just increase this to maybe 50 or maybe 60. I think this will be fine. And what I want to do from here is if I drop down a blast from my pieces and select only the inside. Let's uh, use this delete non-selected and we end up with this geometry. So this is right on the inside of the pieces. So we can use this to create our cutter surfaces that we will then later use inside of a Boolean fracture. And like we mentioned earlier, in order for this to work, we need to make sure that, that this cutter surface is big enough to intersect our whole geometry. And because later we will also add some noise to this geometry, we will want this inside group to be a little bit bigger. So we can see if I were to template this geometry, our cutter is right on the edges of this geometry. So we want this to be a little bit bigger. We can drop down a bounds from this geometry and we will make this just slightly bigger than our geometry. So maybe 0.3 in all of the directions here. And we will use this bounds to create our cutter geometry. So maybe I will just replace this here and we have our object merge. So we have our terrain here. We do our bounds and then we do our Voronoi fracture on the bounds. So we end up with this geometry. So if I were to template my geometry now, we can see that this is, this is now slightly, so the cutter surface is slightly bigger than our geometry. And we can see here that even though this is bigger, this might not be, um, big enough because when we add our noise this will really distort all of these edges so we might want to go to our bounds actually and let's just increase this to one and one and go to our blast so now we have enough room to work with uh, this geometry so one of the problems that we have here is we can see that as i move around the viewport we have this weird flickering going on for all of these polygons and this is because we really have a lot of polygons that are right on top of each other so if i were to press s and select this and delete it 
we still have this uh, polygon that's on the other side. So let's get rid of these blast nodes. So we have a lot of geometry that's right on top of each other. So the first thing that we want to do here is we also have all of the points are right on top of each other as well. So if I select a point here and press T to move it around, we can see that there is another point that's right on top of it. So let's get rid of this delete. The first thing that we want to do is fuse all of the all of the points that are right on top of each other. So let's drop down a fuse node. And by default, the, these uh, settings should be fine. And now we can delete all of the overlapping geometry if we drop down a clean node. And uh, let's uh, turn on fix overlaps. And we also want to uncheck delete overlap pairs. So now as I navigate my scene, we should have no flickering and we will only have just one polygon for each of these sides. So if I were to go to my polygon selection and delete this, it will only grab one polygon, so this is perfect. All right, in order to add noise to this uh, cutter surface, uh, we will have to remesh this. So let's drop down a remesh and uh, let's maybe start with a higher target size, so maybe 0.4 and let's preview this result. Let's press Shift W. This looks like it matches our terrain uh, fairly well. So from here, we will just do a mountain and again, we will disable noise along vector, increase the element size and decrease the amplitude. And again, we will only need this noise really to be on the X and Z direction. So we will split this up and get rid of this Y value, this one in the middle. I'll just set this to zero. So we only need noise in two directions. So we will just increase this a little bit. And we have to make sure right here around the borders that this geometry, if I were to increase the noise here further, we can see that this really alters our geometry. And in this case, for example, here, it will no longer completely cover our object. So we want to make sure that we have enough room for this uh, cutter surface with this, uh, with the bounds so the values here and also that our noise isn't so big that it alters the geometry to step inside of our uh, geometry that we want to cut so hopefully this makes sense i'll just set this to a sensible value here maybe even less all right we'll do something like this and we can see that by default this geometry is right outside of our uh, geometry that we want to cut so this will be pretty optimized to just uh, add a boolean fracture. So from here, from our terrain, I will go ahead and drop down a boolean fracture and we'll place this as our cutting surface. And now when I preview this, this is going to be super fast. And because we are basically using a Voronoi method to create our pieces, all of uh, all of the pieces will have a rather, uh, a more consistent size between them, but also have enough randomness as well. So if I were to compare this to our Boolean fracture, let's look at this or maybe preview the normal. We can see that this is the size between pieces and over here we have a little bit more consistency. So also if I increase the scatter here, let's maybe double this to 120. We are bringing the best of uh, both worlds, uh, Voronoi and the Boolean. And we can see that this is super fast, the pieces are consistent, and so this is my preferred method of fracturing stuff. Uh, let's set this maybe to a lower value, maybe to 80, and we can also do our grout to this as well. So after this remesh, after we have our initial cutter object before we do the noise, we can do the same thing with a copy and transform. We will do two copies of this, or maybe three, Let's do three here. Let's add a connectivity and then let's use this connectivity inside of our noise and say that the offset will be connectivity will be this class value and also multiply this by three maybe. So now we have a lot of planes that are on top of each other with different noises. And when we do the Boolean fracture, we can see now that it's actually taking a second, but not uh, that bad. And we can do an exploded view. So we also have the Voronoi and the Grout and a lot of detail between pieces and maybe I can actually, let's go to the mountain here and just increase the amplitude maybe, let's, uh, let's do 0.7, add a little bit more noise. So this will also increase the number of uh, total pieces here. Okay, 
So this will be the result. So I think this is looking pretty good. And like I said, this is my preferred method of fracturing. And uh, really, you can now add whatever other cutter surfaces you want to this initial cutter. So maybe from here, let's just go ahead and I'll grab all of these and I'll press Ctrl C, bring them over here and let's relink everything to where we need to. So let's point these back to our uh, to our surface and here we have the cutters and the blast and uh, let's maybe not do our copy thing here so I'll just disable this copy node and let's maybe let's leave this at 10 and maybe change the global seed so we can also now grab this let's merge this with our initial cutter okay so we end up with something like this and now we have the Voronoi fracturing as a base and we also add some random planes to break up things even further so this is let's maybe do an exploded view so this is with our extra planes let's maybe increase the scatter here let's maybe do 20 for the planes all right so this will be with our planes and if i were to disable our extra planes just have the Voronoi this is the result. So we can see that by adding even more cutter surfaces on top of our Voronoi surface, we bring the best of both worlds. So we also, we have a consistent size across the pieces. And then we also introduce a little bit more uh, randomness by adding our separate cutters over here. Okay, so this will be the boolean uh, the voronoi plus uh, boolean method so this is what i usually do in uh, my projects especially well mostly for uh, concrete so this is boolean plus uh, rather let's do voronoi plus uh, boolean so this technique uh, pretty much works with any object uh, let's maybe copy all of these and i just want to show this on a sphere it works uh, pretty well and I'll get rid of this merge here and let's maybe just do a sphere and let's make sure that this is big enough let's do polygon and increase the subdivisions here and I will just simply replace uh, my ground with this sphere and if I do an exploded view directly on this sphere uh, this should work And here we have it. So we can see that we don't really have, this looks like a perfect sphere, but uh, it's all uh, sliced up. So this uh, Voronoi fracture work, works uh, really well. So we also see that we have ground, we have grout between pieces and we can add our custom surface planes to this as well. And this can be the base, for example, for a very cool uh, planet destruction. So we can see that we really have a lot of detail here, especially in the back. So hopefully this will give you an idea of how to do some fracturing. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's encapsulate this. So one more example with this Voronoi and Boolean technique. Uh, let's grab all of these nodes without the extra cutting surfaces. Let's place them here. Okay, so we go to so we go back to our original look here. Let's get rid of this merge. So because we are doing the Voronoi method here, basically we can art direct this uh, Voronoi. So where we do our scatter here for the points, if we wanted, for example, to do an explosion that kind of goes in uh, some lines in a specific direction. Let's maybe just drop down a line and hopefully this will make sense if I show it. Uh, let's increase the length for this. I will template my terrain actually and let's make sure that this is big enough. So I'll increase the length here. I'll do a copy and transform and we want to rotate this to rotate the copies and we want to rotate in a uniform direction. 
I'll grab the total number here, copy parameter, and here we'll do 360 divided by this number. So paste relative references. So now as I increase this, they will have the same distance between all of these lines. So let's maybe let's maybe do five, which is a little bit more e uneven, and let's maybe just increase this line this length even further to make sure that it goes outside of our geometry. And from here we can uh, introduce some noise to this, but we will just do a scatter and disable relax iterations and just scatter a few points and we will just do a point jitter and we only want to jitter this on the x and z so let's uh, set the y value to zero and just increase the scale and maybe untemplate this so we only look at our uh, scatter here and maybe do even more points Okay, so we have our main scatter points over here from this fog volume and we will just merge our new points from the lines over here. Okay, so when we do the Voronoi fracture, we have more pieces that are right on our lines. So when we do our uh, Boolean fracture here, let's just preview the exploded view directly. We have all of this uh, nice detail on on basically where our lines uh, were. So let's maybe disable this grouting by disabling this copy here. And let's just look at our pieces without the extra grout uh, elements. Okay, so if I were to increase the scatter from my lines even further, let's do 500, we should have even smaller pieces that are right along the lines. And we probably need to make some adjustments here. Let's look at our Voronoi. Uh, we might benefit if we just transform all of these points. Let's just bring these up a little bit. And you can kind of see as I scroll, as I use the scroll wheel to increase this uh, direction here. If we bring these up, we will only get more pieces that are right on the surface, which are which is what matters uh, to us. So maybe I'll also increase the scatter overall. So the first scatter, I'll increase this here. But we can see that this is one of the advantages of the Voronoi technique is you can art direct the fracturing by introducing more points exactly where you want. So this is mainly just to give you an idea of how powerful this can be. So if I go to my exploded view, we have more pieces uh, across the lines and this is kind of hard to tell. Uh, maybe we can get rid of this transform actually. Okay, so now we can see we have all of these pieces that are right along the lines. So this is an idea of how uh, you can use this method to have more control over your fracture. So let's copy this. This is Art Direct Voronoi. So let's talk a little bit about how to handle UVs when it comes to these uh, fractures. So let's first make sure that our original terrain has UVs. Uh, so this one over here. Uh, let's maybe create the UVs after the grid. So I'll drop down a UV texture which should have the right projection axis. So if I preview the terrain and do a UV quick shade here, turn off the material display. So we have UVs, so this is great. Uh, I'll leave this maybe on for the material display. And uh, let's work on this uh, Voronoi plus, uh, plus Boolean example here. So first I will go ahead and go to my Boolean fracture and we will, uh, since these are basically two separate cutter objects, we will have to create separate UVs from, for them. So I will maybe disable this merge for now. So we will only work first with our Voronoi cutter surface. So we go to our Voronoi fracture and we go to our blast, fuse and clean. So we end up with this geometry and we will assign UVs to this geometry before we do our remesh. So after this clean node, I can add a UV flatten. And by default, this will take uh, really all of the surfaces of these uh, polygons and it will, it will create some UVs for them. So this will be, uh, I think, the most ideal way to create UVs in this case. So if I do a UV quick shade, let's actually go to our remesh and this UV attribute will transfer to our remesh. So uh, if I do a UV quick shade from here, here we can see we have pretty straight looking UVs. 
So uh, let's get rid of this UV quick shade. So we, when we do our Boolean fracture, we have inside this node this option to copy cutting surface attributes. So we can grab the UVs from our cutter objects. Let's turn this on. And for the vertex attributes, we can specify that we want to grab the UV. We can also grab the normal, but we will just recompute the normal after. So that's fine. Uh, Alright, so let's drop down a UV quick shade from here and let's do an exploded view. So we can see now that all of uh, our pieces have UVs on the inside as well. Okay, let's also maybe drop down a normal here for these inside pieces and increase the cusp angle. Uh, there's a problem here which is that the scale of the UVs don't really match and we can do a UV transform, let's do it before the UV quickshade. So after this normal I will drop down a UV transform and uh, we will only transform our inside uh, polygons. So if I increase the scale here, I can just increase the scale until we sort of match the scale between the UVs of our surface UVs and our inside UVs. So really here you are just kind of uh, guessing the right scale but it really doesn't have to be that perfect. So we have another uh, surface here and for our cutter objects that's made from our grids we will generate the UVs after this grid here so we will do a UV texture which will be on the Y projection which is great and we can maybe we can do a UV quick shade over here after our blast so we can see it here so what needs to happen here is the scale of this object here so the scale of the UVs for this uh, needs to be sort of close to the scale of the UVs for this so if I do a UV quick shade here these kind of have to match and if we take a look I think they kind of do probably this cutter object uh, has a little bit too big uh, has a little bit bigger UVs so let's maybe do a UV transform here and uh, we might benefit if we scale this up just a little bit so maybe 1.2 we just need this to roughly match okay so when we do the merge here and then do our uh, boolean fracture. Let's take a look at the exploded view. We can look at our pieces and we can look at the inside and we can see that the scale between the UVs are pretty consistent, I believe. So this is how you can take care of the UVs. So let's now talk a little bit about recursive fracturing and really about how you can uh, create certain selections of pieces to do further fracturing on. So maybe I will just grab my the Voronoi uh, section here and I will control C and I will bring it over here and I will maybe let's clean this up a little bit. So here is the bounds and the fracture. Okay, we do the remesh. Uh, let's not do copy for this and the connectivity and we'll get rid of this noise expression, get rid of the UVs and the UV flatten. Alright, and this merge. So we just end up with the base Voronoi fracture and let's get rid of these UV nodes. So we have uh, these pieces here and maybe I will just increase the scatter to 150. So we add a little bit more pieces. Okay, so from here, before the exploded view, the easiest way that you can make any kind of selection is if you pack all of the pieces and treat them as points. So from here, I will drop down an assemble node and we don't need to create the name attribute because we have them and we will do create packed primitive. So now all of these are treated as points. We can see here we have 155 points, which is 155 uh, pieces basically and we have 155 uh, packed fragments. So basically what happens here is that maybe you want some of these pieces to do some, fract uh, some further fracturing on. So from this assemble node I can go ahead and if I press S and go in my point mode we can see that we can select really any of these pieces. So let's maybe say I select this piece, I press delete Let's do for my blast the delete non-selected and I want to do further fracturing to this. I will have to unpack it first. So in order to access the geometry for this piece, then you have to unpack 
uh, the geometry okay so we can see it here and we also bring in our name attribute so from here I can just do another let's drop a scatter scatter three points and let's do a Voronoi fracture okay so we introduce a little bit more pieces so we end up with this and we can do an exploded view let's maybe do uh, let's add a little bit more uh, separations here so we let's say we fractured this piece and now we want to merge it back with our original pieces so here where we made our selection let's go ahead and duplicate this node by holding alt and I will inverse this selection here and unpack all of these uh, back so we have the geometry and then you would basically just merge this back in and one of the things that you will have to take into account when you do recursive fracturing is the name attribute so inside this Voronoi fracture we can see that we have this name attribute set to overwrite but since we already have a name attribute for recursive fracturing we would have to send this we would have to set this operation to append instead and for the piece pref prefix you can uh, type whatever you want so you can you can maybe do underscore underscores and say small but really my preferred way of doing things here is to just add a dash so if I go to this Voronoi fracture and go to my geometry spreadsheet and uh, primitives we can see that we have this piece 99 so our selection here is 99 this is a piece with the name uh, piece 99 and when we do our Voronoi fracture we can see that the name changes to piece 99 dash and then it adds the number of the sub fracture so uh, this starts at zero and since we had let's say I think five this will go from zero to four I believe so one two three and four so we have five pieces now so we need to be mindful of this name attribute when we do any kind of recursive uh, fracturing so we merge this back together and if I turn on my display here we have it and if I compare it with my original one we can see that we have this piece here and then this is split up into separate pieces so here I'm just doing the simplest uh, fracturing the for the simple Voronoi fracturing but obviously you can do whatever kind of fracturing you want additionally some of the times what I do is instead of using this append function here I just drop down an assemble so after I do my recursive fracturing I drop down a final assemble node and I do a create name attribute so we can see that when we do this assemble we end up with new names for each of our polygons that aren't connected to each other which is basically what the assemble node does so this just overrides all of the pieces for all of the geometry that's not connected and uh, this will ensure that all of the names are unique so maybe sometimes it's just better to just do a final assemble over uh, all of the pieces when you put them back together so if I drop down exploded view we can see that this works just as fine so this is how basically the recursive fracturing works and maybe I will uh, drag this over here and let's start with a new base from this normal so usually what happens is uh, you are not really going to manually select uh, the pieces usually you will create a condition or threshold uh, to create an automatic selection so one of the common conditions that you will find is you might want to select pieces based on their size so we can do a measure stop from here and we will want to measure the area and we will do per piece and the name has to be name so we will specify it here name and now we have this area attribute for all of our primitives and we can see it goes from uh, really small numbers to all the way up to 74 so if I do a split sop from here and I go to this cogwheel and create a perimeter I want to drop down a float inside our uh, split here and we will just uh, say that this is threshold and I'll hit accept so now I will right click to copy parameter and I will say that we want to create an automatic group which will be at area is bigger than and I will right click and paste relative references so now we will make a selection based on the size of our pieces so if I increase this we can see that the small pieces start to disappear and as I further increase this let's maybe do shaded view and I'll just increase this 
we can see that as I increase this we start to select bigger and bigger pieces until we are left with only the largest uh, pieces. So over from this output here, this will be our uh, big pieces. Okay, and I'll hold down Alt and this is our small pieces. Okay, so we can also preview what we separate. Maybe this is a little bit too much. Let's do 35 or 25. Uh, or maybe 35. So uh, all I'm trying to demonstrate here is different ways that you can select your pieces to do a recursive fracturing on. So now from over on our big pieces, let's say that we want to fracture these even further, we would have to do a for each loop here. So from here I will drop a for each named primitive and plug this here. So if I go to this for each end, let's turn on single pass and we can see that we are iterating through all of these pieces. So here, let me just copy this setup that we had for our initial uh, recursive fracturing, paste it over here, and let's plug this here and this over here. So we have our fracturing happening, and we don't really need this unpack node because we didn't uh, pack these, these uh, aren't uh, packed primitives. Okay, so we do some simple Voronoi fracturing and now if I disable single pass and let this run through all of the pieces we can see that we fractured all of these and uh, like I said we have to keep tabs on this name attribute so this is set to append when we merge this back with our small pieces we should have the result here so we can see we can compare it uh, before we did the recursive fracturing this is the result and now we grab all of the bigger pieces and we slice them up into smaller pieces. So inside this for each loop again you can use any of our fracturing methods that you want. You can uh, slice up the pieces further by using cutter geometry and you can do a boolean fracture here. But this is just to give you a quick example of how the recursive fracturing would work. We can also do a random selection so let's demonstrate this from our normal uh, this random selection will work better if we turn these into packed uh, pieces. So I'll do an assemble here and let's uh, disable create name attribute and create packed primitives. So now these are points and let's go ahead and create a group based on this uh, random value. So let's do an attribute wrangle. So let's create a random value first and we don't really have to store this as an attribute, we'll just create our group directly inside this attribute wrangle. So I'll say float val equals to rand and in between parentheses I will do ptnum and I will also want to add a seed to this. So I will say ptnum plus chi, I'll just do this as an integer but we can also use float but uh, let's just do integer and in between parentheses I'll say random seed. Okay and semicolon to end the line. So this will generate for each of these pieces a random value, this uh, val over here and then I can say that if in between parentheses this val is bigger than and I'll create a channel ch threshold or just thresh then I will uh, place the point inside a group so uh, the syntax for this will be i at group underscore and then the name of the groups so I will say the name of the group will be selection equals one so if we meet this condition for each of these given points we will be placed in a group called selection by using this syntax here. So I'll create my channels now. So let's give these some random values for now and let's see if this works. Let's maybe rename this to create selection and let's do another split over here and we will just look for our selection. Okay and we can see that this already is working. So let's do a null here and this will be selected and this will be keep this simple and say not selected. Okay so this will be just a random selection and now we can go inside this attribute wrangle and we can increase the threshold or decrease this. So let's just say maybe that I want to select 25% uh, of the pieces randomly and we can use this random seed to create different selections. So we want to select 25% randomly we have them uh, actually this is the other way around so maybe we can invert the selection. These are 25% uh, random pieces here and then we can uh, 
also do all of these operations. So let me let me just copy paste our Voronoi here. And because we assemble these and turn these into points, let's maybe unpack these now. So let's make sure that we are working with geometry before we do our uh, recursive fracturing. And I will also copy this over here to our non-selected as well. So we do our fracturing, we merge these together. And there we have it, 25% of these uh, pieces randomly will be split into more pieces. So maybe I can increase the threshold, let's say that 50% of these pieces will have recursive fracturing and there you have it. Okay, so this is, it's really the way you select these pieces. Uh, the refractive, the recursive part is right over here with this for each named primitive uh, for loop. So let me maybe show you just one other way to select pieces based on a distance to another geometry. So over here where we created our lines, we have these lines over here. Let's maybe just copy paste these here and let's look at our pieces or maybe let's look at our lines in relation to our pieces. So. Let's maybe try to select all of the pieces that are closest to this geometry. And again, in order to do this, we uh, are better off working with points. So I will hold down Alt to create a copy of this assemble node. So here we have all of our pieces, which are points. And let's drop down an attribute wrangle from here. And I will place this geometry as my second input here. And we want to create an attribute that records the distance from each of these points to the closest point on the surface of this geometry. And we will use XYZ this for this. And I will say float this. I'll just name this this, but you can give this whatever name you want. I will say XYZ this. And we will look at our second input, so one, and we will generate this from our current position. So this is the entire code. And then we have to create this condition. So I will say if this dist attribute is greater than a threshold channel, then I will do the same thing. I will say I at group selection equals one. Let's maybe take a look and see. Yeah, we, we named this selection as well. So now I can just grab this split attribute over here paste it here and we should, uh, if we preview this, we can now go to our attribute wrangle and create our channels. And as I increase this, we can see that we start to select only the pieces that are closest to our geometry. So then again, we can maybe just straight up copy all of these, bring them over here and link all of these up. So we have the selection here and then we do our recursive fracturing and we can see that we, all of the pieces that are closest to this geometry are split apart. So let's maybe use a value of 10 here. Okay. So this is also one of the ways that you can create a selection. So this is based on a distance to a uh, input geometry. So hopefully this will give you an idea of how to create recursive fracturing. So let's also cover a little bit of uh, chipping detail. So maybe from over here, uh, I'll do a null and uh, I'll just name this to pieces and I want to make our chipping in another network or rather a different chain. So I'll grab these pieces null and I just want to do an object merge and just bring it over to the side. Uh, all right, so uh, we can do this per piece. We can use the for each named uh, primitive. So let's maybe do a for each named primitive and uh, let's do a single pass and select a bigger piece here. Okay, so let's work on this. And really what we need to do here is we need a way to be able to select these corners so we can scatter some points on them. So first we want to do an edge selection. So I will drop down a group node and set the type to edges. And I might also rename this to edges group name. Uh, let's disable base group and we will do an include by edges and we will turn on this mean edge angle option here. And I will increase this until we select only really these uh, border edges for our pieces. So really only the edges that have these uh, steep angle. 
Okay, so we want to filter some of these, these uh, edges out and let's say that this will be fine and we want to convert this selection to an actual curve so we can use the labs, this labs edge group to curve, all right, and let's select our edges group here. So this will just turn this into a primitive and now we can drop a scatter and we can scatter points from here. Uh, let's uh, get rid of this for now and now from here we can select only these corners by selecting the points that have multiple primitives attached to them. So if I turn on my points display and maybe we can also do a resample here and let's use a lower edge length here. All right, so we just want to scatter some points. So we only really need, we can see that this point here on the corner is connected with three primitives and all of the other points is just connected uh, with one primitive between them. So we need a way to do this selection and we can drop down an attribute wrangle and we can find out how many primitives are attached to a point by using the point prims uh, function here. So let's create a value here and this will be an integer value. So I will say int prim count and if we do the point prims function, we will run this on uh, our own geometry, on ourselves, so zero, and we will run this on each point. So this uh, function by default actually returns an array. So we would need to do an array here. But since we only want to know just how many primitives are attached to a point, we will only really need to measure this array. So we will do a len before this point prims and we will place everything else inside parentheses. All right. So now that we know how many primitives are attached to a point, we'll say that if your print count is bigger than one, so if you have more than one primitive attached to yourself, then we will set your color to one. So everything else will be black. And if I press enter here and disable this point view, we should be getting these uh, corners white. And there's a problem here that after we do our resample, if I just go to the resample node, we can press S and if I select this point here and press T to move it, we can see that our resample split up all of our uh, primitives. So we have to do a fuse after this resample. So if I drop down a fuse from here, just with the default settings. Now, if I select this point in the center here in the corner and press T, we see that we have a point that's connected with all of the primitives. Let's get rid of this edit. And now if I do this uh, print points operation, and for some reason, uh, writing it with this syntax doesn't work. So instead, what I'll do is I'll say that uh, CD equals to print count bigger than one. So now we can see that this works. And this is essentially saying, so with uh, this CD is going to check for this condition. So if this uh, print count is bigger than one, it will uh, use a value of one. And if it's not greater than one, so it's one or zero, then this uh, will evaluate to zero. So CD will be between one and zero. So we can see now that we selected all of these corners now. So from here, we can do an attribute blur and we can set the attribute to be CD and we can just increase these iterations and let's disable pin border points since this is a curve and we can increase the step size and play around with some of these settings. But now what we can do essentially is we can drop down a scatter and we can use this density attribute and we can set it to CD. So let's disable relax iterations and we can see if I turn on my point display that we are scattering pieces right around the corners here. All right, so let's scatter some points and now we are simply going to copy some geometry onto these points. Let's just use a simple sphere and set this to a polygon and we will do a copy to points and use our points as the template points here. Okay, and let's maybe template our geometry here by pressing E and now we will do a Boolean with our uh, spheres. So from here, I'll do a Boolean fracture and use our spheres as a cutting surface. So let's place this here and let's see what we get. So we have some pieces right on the corners. So if I do an exploded view, this is what we get. And inside this Boolean fracture, since we are using a filled object, we have to set the thread cutting geometry as a solid object. This didn't make uh, much difference, but just to make things official, we will set this to be uh, solid. 
Uh, one thing here we can see is that we are really having a lot of, let's maybe drop down a colored node so we can see this. Uh, we have a lot of intersecting geometry here. So one way that we can fix this actually, and this is another tip with using Boolean techniques, is if I drop down a Boolean union from here and place this geometry as my first input but also as my second input, if I go to this geometry now, this will get rid of all of the intersection uh, just with the default settings. So we can see solid solid and the operation is set to union. So if I press W to view the wireframe, as I turn this on and off, we can see that we get rid of all of this interior uh, intersection here between the pieces. As a result, if I do my exploded view now and let's do a solid view, we can see that we only have these field pieces. So if I turn this off, we have this intersection here and with this, we only have these uh, pieces. So, so we can maybe now increase uh, the scattering here. Alright, so this would be how you can, uh, this is mainly how to select the corner uh, points by using this point prims expression here. So this is the selection that we are interested in and you probably can tell but let me go to the geometry and increase the wire width here. Okay, so we only want really to select the lines here that are right on the, on the corners. So of course uh, you might want to add some noise to this as well to this geometry and maybe some more frequency. So if I drop down a mountain noise, you can probably guess uh, how this is going to work. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this right now, but you just add a little bit of noise to the sphere. Okay, so something like this, and then we look at our result. So now we have just a little bit more uh, detail on our chipping. So this will be the chipping. So finally I also want to talk a little bit about glass and let's do some custom glass fracturing. So let's maybe just do a grid over here and uh, let's uh, rotate this 90 degrees and I'll keep this as a 10 by 10. This will be fine. And let's first try to use the Boolean fracture to create our pieces. And really it's all about the methods used to generate the cutting surface. So let's try to create some lines that go from the center of this geometry and go straight out. So I will start by using an add node to create a point right in the center here. And I will give this a normal that points straight up. So let's drop down an attribute wrangle and I'll say n equals to set 0, 1 and 0. So we just have a normal that points straight up and we can use a copy and transform a node. And we want to rotate all of these points like so. So we need to adjust this rotate value on the z direction here. And we will grab the total number of points, right click, copy parameter, and this uh, third value here will set to 3360 divided by this total number. So now as I increase the points here, we can see we create this radial display. So now I can use a line and uh, let's go ahead and copy to points. Let's go ahead and copy it over to our points and this line needs to point straight in the Z direction. So let's set the direction here to 0, 0 and 1 and I'll also increase the length. So if I go to my copy to points, this will be the result and let's template our grid and see exactly how big we need our line to be. So I'll make this go outside of the bounds of this uh, glass. So after this copy to points, so after we create all of our points, let's do an attribute randomize and we want to randomize the n and we have to set the minimum value here to negative one when we are working with vectors and we actually don't really want any randomness on the z direction. So I'll set the third value here, which is the z to zero and zero. Okay, so we can set this operation now to add value and we can decrease the global scale and we can see that we can just add a little bit of variation in our orientation for the lines. So when we do our copy to points, let's preview the grid. Well, let's go to the random here and we can just, maybe let's increase this a little bit and we can add a little bit more copies. So let's increase the total number here. And with this attribute randomized, we see that we just uh, add a little bit more variation. 
All right, so let's say that this is fine. And for this line, let's do a resample. So let's add some subdivisions to this. And we will also want to output the curve view attribute, which is an attribute that goes from zero to one. So now we can add some noise to this and we can also scale this noise. So let's go ahead and from here I will do an attribute VOP and we will rename this to add noise. We want to add some custom noise and we want to drive different uh, different parameters for the noise with some custom values. And uh, let's step inside and first let's create a turbulent noise from our position. Let's do a 3D noise. Let's just add this to our position and see what we get. So let's add this to our P. Okay, so this is fine and we only, we don't need any scale on the Z direction. And again, we will do a multiply after our noise, promote this to a constant. Let's use three floats and use one, one and zero. So we only want this on the Y and X directions. All right, and I will right click and promote all of these parameters for the noise. So let's maybe go up a level and let's set this to a simplex noise and reduce the frequency maybe a little bit and I will increase the amplitude. So we run into a few problems here. We want our noise to not have such a big scale right here in the center. So we can use our curve view attribute to scale up this noise along the length of the curves. So if I go inside here, we can drop down a bind and we will use the curve view attribute. And let's double click this amplitude value here. And we just want to multiply this with our curve U. So let's do a multiply for our amp and multiply it with our curve view. And we can see now that the noise scale or rather amplitude fades along the length of these uh, curves. And we can also add a ramp here. And let's set this to be a spline ramp. And we will rename this to ramp curve U. Copy this to the label as well. And now I can go up and we can play around with this ramp as well to influence our scaling. So maybe I'll add a point here, grab all of the handles by holding shift, set them to B spline to have this move interpolation. So maybe something like this. And one other thing that I want to add here is a little bit of variation between each of these uh, curves. So we need to assign a value that's consistent through all of the curves and it's different for each of these curves. And we can do this by assigning an attribute for our points here. So the points that we copy our lines onto, uh, we can see that we have 21 points that that are all laid on top of each other. And if I do an attribute wrangle, let's give all of these an ID. So we will say that your ID will be equal to your point number. So if I preview this add noise now, let's maybe create a visualizer for our ID. So we can see that all of these have a different ID. And we can go inside and we can grab this offset value. Let's double click. So we can access this parameter and let's create a new vector from our ID. So let's do from the ID, we will do a float to vector and we will use the X direction. So the first one, and we will just want to add this new vector to our offset vector. So we will just add this here. And now we can see we have a different noise pattern for all of our lines. And we can accentuate this difference even more by multiplying this ID. So let's do here a multiply constant and let's multiply this ID value by maybe three. Okay, so now we make sure that there's enough difference between the offset, between the noise offset of each of these uh, lines. So I can go up and now we can make all uh, different adjustments as we see fit. So we can increase the noise and the roughness and play around with the frequency and stuff like that. And uh, we can, and the cool thing about this is that we can see that we will get direct feedback on how our pieces will look. So we don't really have to wait for stuff to compute and we will have instant feedback on how the pieces will look. So maybe I'll just decrease, let's maybe use sparse convolution and just decrease the amplitude. So something like this. I think this will be fine. Maybe play around with the frequency. All right, so I don't want to waste uh, time adjusting things now, but this is what we are going to use as a base for our cutting geometry. So from here, all I have to do is do a poly extrude and we will just extrude this straight in the Z direction. So let's use global here and just push this in the Z. Okay, so we give them some thickness and then we can grab this grid 
do a boolean fracture let's do the boolean fracture here and this is a let's uh, set this tree geometry as surface because this doesn't have any thickness and this is how i actually prefer to do glass fracturing and this will work in cases where the glass doesn't isn't really super thick so in most cases the glass will be kind of thin so you get rid of a lot of headache if you just use a surface instead of a solid object to create the fracturing and then after you have all of your pieces you can just extrude them out and give them some thickness and I'll show you how this works in a second so we will treat geometry as surface and use our cutters here and we can see if I drop an exploded view this will be our pieces and like I mentioned, uh, after we have our pieces, we can just do a poly extrude. And we will again just extrude this straight in the Z direction. Let's maybe go in the positive direction. So we, so really, like I said, in most cases, you only really need a little bit of thickness. And let's output back as well. So our name will propagate with this poly extrude, meaning that so all of these will have uh, different names. Okay, so we might want to go ahead and let's maybe just decrease the amplitude for this noise a little bit. And you can see how fast this is and how much control you have and uh, the instant f uh, feedback that you get from using this technique instead of the RBT material fracture. And maybe we can even do more copies here for our points so we, we can increase this number here. And some of these tiny slivers here, maybe we can help if we go to this uh, curve view ramp and we just add another point here that's right to the center and maybe we can offset this point a little bit. So the first one and we can see that we got rid of uh, a few of these uh, really, really small uh, slivers. Okay, we still end up with this and we can just adjust uh, the noise here, the offset maybe until we get rid of it. So maybe something like this. So we end up with these pieces. So now for some concentric fractures, let's uh, actually get rid of this poly extrude. So we will do some further fracturing. This will be some uh, recursive fracturing. And from this uh, fracture, we will do a for each named primitive. And we will do this operation per piece. And let's do a single pass and just work on one piece for now. So for the cutter surface let's use another add node and let's uh, create a point in the center let's do a point replicate and let's do three copies of this point I'll set this to three and the uniform scale to three so now we have three points right on top of each other and I can give this a P scale that's based on the point number so let's do an attribute wrangle and I will say that your P scale is equal to PT num and since this uh, the PT num starts at zero we will just add one here so for three points in this case we will have a p scale that goes one two and three so now if i drop down a tube let's look at our tube and preview our geometry here uh, let's uh, rotate this on the z axis and i'll give this some uh, an initial radius here and maybe i'll increase we don't really need a lot of height i'll maybe increase the columns here and let's do a copy two points and uh, when we do our copy two points we see that we have three planes and we can just use this as a base for our cutting geometry so of course for this tube uh, for this cutting surface we will use a mountain turn off noise along vector and let's uh, let's increase this uh, element size and we will split this up so we don't so we don't want any amplitude on the z direction set this to zero here and maybe decrease this a little bit and what we can do, we can see that we don't have enough topology. And what we can do to have consistent topology between uh, these copies, let's go to this copy to point and I will just drop down a remesh instead here. Okay, so now we have enough resolution. Let's uh, check our mountain and maybe I will adjust some of these settings a little bit. So let's say something like this or maybe even more and increase the element size. Right, so maybe we want to randomize the noise between each of these copies and we can do the same thing that we did with our uh, ID here. So let's maybe rename this to add ID. I will just copy this attribute wrangle to our points over here. So we have some different IDs for all of these. Let's disable the visualization. And inside this mountain, we can use Vexpression for the offset. 
and we can say that this offset is equal to our ID and also multiply this by a value of 3. So each of these copies will now have a different noise applied to them. Let's introduce a little bit of variation between this P scale. So let's go to our attribute wrangle with the P scale. Let's rename this to set P scale and we can use an attribute randomize for this. So let's drop down an attribute randomize. Let's set the attribute name to P scale and this will only have one dimension. And let's add to our original value and let's set the minimum and maximum to negative one and one. So if I look at my copy two points, we can see we have some variation now. And if I go to this attribute randomize, we can, uh, we can influence how much of this randomness we want. Okay, so let's maybe just add a little bit of uh, variation here and let's preview the result. Okay, so this looks good. So let's do now a Boolean fracture. So let's drop down a Boolean fracture here inside our for each node and let's preview this. So this again has to be set to surface since this is flat, this doesn't have any thickness. Let's place this as our cutter and now we can see our result. And let's do maybe an exploded view here. Okay, so this will be the result. So if I uncheck single pass and run this over all of our pieces, let's see what we get. And let's do the exploded view after. And so we have a problem with the name here and this is because this is set to override. So we should have set this to append or after we do our fracturing, we can just do another assemble node and create a new name for all of the pieces. And now we can do our exploded view and let's turn off the visualizer. So we add some concentric cutters as well. Now, obviously this doesn't look natural and organic. And this is because we have to randomize a lot of these settings here for our cutter surface. We will have to randomize this per piece. So we will also want to use a compiled block for this in order for all of these operations to work a lot faster. And for this, we will need to make our uh, cutter geometry that we generate here. We have to make it part of our for each block. So this add node can stay the same. We will always start with our geometry right here in the center, but everything that comes after this, we will want to modify per uh, iteration. So let's drop down a block begin over here and I'll place this here and we want this method to be fetch input so we always want to start from this add node and for this block begin so we set the method to fetch input and the block path will point to our last node here that evaluates everything so I will grab this and just place this here so now we encapsulated everything here so now we can also drop down a block begin compile and I will place this here and right at the end we will do a block and compile and by default this will encapsulate our for each block but but we have to make sure that for this first node here we need to set the block path for this to point to our compile end over here. So now this should work and if I go to this for each and uh, let's uh, enable multi-thread well compiled Let's look at our compile and uh, everything should work. And we can see that it does and we can do our exploded view. So uh, this works. So now everything will be a lot faster with this compiled block. So now in order to randomize certain parameters for all of these nodes, we will need to access the current number of iteration that we are currently running on. So from this for each begin, we will click on this create meta import node. So this will give us some values here, but the value that we are interested in is going to be this iteration here. So this is the current number of iteration that is currently running. So if I go to this for each begin and go to the single pass, this is the first iteration, so zero. And if we want to go to the next iteration, iteration this will be one two three four so we are really accessing this number here through this meta import uh, node so let's take a look at some of the stuff that we want to randomize and the first will be this point replicate so maybe for each given piece i want to scatter a random number between one and four so first in order to access this node inside a compiled block we have to go to this cog wheel and we have to use this add spare input option here and then we will place 
our metadata node inside this pair input. And you can see that this creates this dotted line over here, which links up these two nodes. And so if we want to grab the number of iteration that this node is currently on, we will do, and let's do it here, we will say detail, and inside parentheses, first we will have to point to our block, which is this one, and we can access this pair input here by using a value of negative one. So this will point to our block and then from here we will want to grab the iteration and then and then zero because this attribute only has one dimension. Okay, so if I evaluate this expression, this will give me number seven, which is the number that we are currently on. So this number now will alter per piece. So if I do single pass, if I go to iteration number 10 here, we can see that this will give me 10. So now that we have this number, we can generate a random number that goes from 0 to 1 based on this. So we will place all of this inside a random function. So we will say rand and place this in between parentheses. So now that we have a random number per piece, we can fit this random number to a new range and we will do fit 0, 1 and place everything in between parentheses. And before the last parentheses, we will fit this, we will do comma and we will fit this. Let's do maybe two and five. So now this will evaluate to a random number between two and five per p. So we can see that we end up with this weird looking number uh, and this is a float. So in order to turn this into an integer, we can just do a round here. So we will type round and place everything inside parentheses. So this will evaluate to an integer. Okay, so this is the expression and let's maybe just take a look at our result. Let's go to the compiled result and let's uh, uncheck single pass. And let's look at our assemble actually and preview it with our name. So we can see now that some of these pieces, let's maybe look at our exploded view. Maybe we need to adjust our settings a little bit, but we can see for example here this piece here is no longer split like the other pieces next to it. And also this piece here. Let's maybe go back to our point replicate and instead of two and five, let's do one and five. So now we have even more variations uh, as we can see. So we have these uh, long pieces over here, which are no longer being split into as many sub uh, fractures. Maybe we can go to our P scale and we can use a global value here for our P scale. So I, so I don't really want our secondary cuts to go as far as uh, here. So let's maybe go to the set P scale and I will place this value inside parentheses and I will just do a multiply channel and P scale mult. And I'll create the channels and maybe I'll scale this down 50%. So let's use a 0.5 here and let's see what we get. Okay, so now our secondary cuts don't spread as much. Uh, and maybe we can go to the P scale and maybe we want a little bit more spread. So let's use 0.65. And these are just some of the settings that you can adjust later. So now what we can do is for this attribute randomized for our P scale, we can also randomize this value. If I go to the options here, we can change this global seed value here to be dependent on our current iteration from this metadata node. Okay, so let's also do a spare input for this, add spare input and point to our metadata node. So we can see we have this connection now. And I'll go ahead and from this point replicate, I only really want this detail here. So we only really want to grab the number of iteration. So I will grab this, copy it over to our seed. So now we will have a different seed based on the iteration. And let's preview our result we can see now that increasingly we are starting to add more and more variation. So this is starting to look like uh, actual uh, glass fracture. So I think I'm pretty happy with this result. And finally, the last thing that we can randomize is going to be this mountain noise, so this attribute noise. And now for this offset, I will again just simply paste the number of iteration that it's currently on. So now this offset value will be different for each iteration. And now we can get rid of this uh, use of expression because we don't really need this anymore and this overrides our offset value here anyway. So just get rid of this and now if I go to the result here, we will also have variation uh, in the noise as well. So we can see that this creates a lot of uh, interesting pieces.
All right, so now you can experiment with this and you can go to the point replicate and let's say maybe that you don't want as many pieces. Let's do one and maybe three. Okay, and we can go to this P scale size. We can increase the global scale. And maybe for this point replicate to change the seed of this randomness here, maybe after this parentheses, you can just add a value here. So if I add a value of 50, we will have a different seed and I can use my scroll wheel to just increase the value and find the different seeds for this. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how to use the compile block and how to generate different types of uh, cutter surfaces. And finally, the last method that I want to show here is going to be how to use the Voronoi method to do some glass fracturing. So let's uh, go ahead and grab this grid and start from scratch. So this will be what we want to shatter and we will do the same thing is we are going to just work with this uh, thin surface. So without any depth or thickness, just to make things a little bit easier. So let's go ahead and I'll place this first inside a null and let's scatter some points. Disable relax iterations and let's do a Voronoi fracture with just these points. And we can see that this is the result and we have this weird shading issue and this is because we are using a thin surface we have to disable create inter interior surfaces okay so if i do an exploded view this is what we get so in the same way that we did the noise for this voronoi fracture as in we record the rest before doing any transformations with our grid and then we restore the rest after we do our Voronoi fracture. So I will do a swap rest for the second one here. If I now do a transform over uh, after the rest, so here we record the rest, and then let's say that we do some transformations to this geometry. In this case, I'll just scale it on the X direction. I'll just stretch it maybe a value of three in the X direction. And then we do our fracturing on this version. When we restore our rest, these will be stretched in the Y direction. And if I were to reverse the direction, I'll just scale it in the Y direction. And now they are stretched horizontally. So we can do this stretching thing here, but in order to get uh, shards that look like glass, we have to do a radial stretch. So let's get rid of this transform here and we will record the rest. Let's maybe add a little bit more subdivisions to this uh, geometry and we will do an attribute vob here, which I will rename to stretch. And uh, let's uh, step inside. And first we will need to compute a direction. So we want a direction that points from the center of our world to each of these uh, points. So if I grab this position and I do a subtract, if I promote this second input to a constant, we can set this to be three floats. And by default, this will be zero, zero, zero. So this will be right in the center of our scene. And we can preview this vector by plugging this inside the normal and this is the direction. So let's normalize this value and let's add this now to our position. So I'll drop an add from my position and we want this normalized. We'll plug inside the add and the result will place inside our P and let's get rid of this normal connection now. So we can see if I, let's maybe make some room here and after the normalize, let's also drop down a multiply and I will promote the second input and I will rename this to maybe stretch. Okay, so if I go up and increase this stretch, we can see that from the center of our scene, we are pushing all of our points in this radial direction. So we are going to stretch this and do our Voronoi on this. And when we restore our rest, we end up with this. So this looks kind of like uh, glass fracturing. So if I increase this stretch here and preview my rest, we can kind of see we get uh, more sharper pieces like this. Okay, so let's maybe set this to a lower value here. So maybe something like this. And we can see that this already starts to look like shards. We run into a small problem here, which is when we get close to the center of our object here, we can see that we have a lot of shards, a lot of small shards here, which don't really make sense. And this is because if we look at our stretched geometry, and I press Shift W for the wireframe, we have this really big surface here. So this stretched out polygon 
that's right in the center and we are scattering a bunch of points that's right inside this polygon so I'll template the geometry so we can see that all of these points here will create pieces and when we squeeze them back together in our rest these pieces now here which are basically these pieces here so they create this kind of messy thing over here we can maybe add a bit of more control to the stretching here so we can mitigate this effect a little bit let's go inside this attribute vop and let's also scale this stretch by a distance value so let's compute a distance for each point from the P let's uh, do a distance and we want the second point here to be the same position from where we grab from where we generate our direction attribute. So I'll plug this here, which is the center of our scene. And if I were to disable this add for a second and I will place this inside the CD, we can visualize this value. And we will also do a fit range. And we want to scale the source max up until we get a nice gradient for all of the points. So let's just increase this until maybe something like seven, just so we kind of normalize this value a little bit so the furthest extent will have a value close to one and it's, it's going to be zero in the center so we are sort of just normalizing this range and we will also do a ramp parameter after the fit and we will set this to be a spline ramp and let's go up and reset the ramp so now if i step back inside we can also use this ramp here we will plug directly inside our multiply for the direction that we add let's get rid of the CD connection and let's turn on our add okay and if I go up we can now adjust this ramp to have complete control over the parts that are stretching so if I add another point here we can see that we have more stretch towards the center and less towards the ends here so i can grab all of these handles and i will set the interpolation to b spline just so it's smooth and i will just increase this and we can further modify this uh, ramp and now if i visualize so we are going to fracture these pieces and when we bring them back together this will be the result and we successfully got rid of that small island of uh, really tiny fractured pieces that's right in the center so maybe we can go ahead and for this stretch i can maybe play around with the control and maybe i can just increase the stretch to have sharper pieces and also maybe let's go inside this stretch and i want to promote this source max here so let's promote this and if i decrease this value we should start to see our uh, shards getting a little bit sharper so as I decrease this value we can kind of see the result that we get and as I increase this we get more uniform looking shards so let's maybe just set this to a value of 5 in this case so I think this will look fine and now we can play around with the stretch and this ramp as well until we get what we want I might want to raise this first point a little bit so let's say that we end up with something like this and let's add a little bit more uh, points to our scatter okay so now it's starting to look like uh, shattered glass so again you will play around with the stretch settings with the ramp and the maximum value here to get something that looks good to you furthermore if we want to get rid of some of these pieces that's r that are right here in the center so if these are too many we can just go ahead and if I preview the result of the Voronoi so let's template this and look at our scatter we might want to get rid of these points right here on the center so I can do a group node here after the scatter set this to points and let's use keeping bounding regions and use a sphere and I'll just increase this and I'll rename this to, to delete and I'll drop down a blast and let's get rid of this so to delete and uh, we got rid of these points here so now when we go to our rest we can see that if I were to disable this blast we get a lot more shards and with this blast we kind of got rid of uh, some of these and we can just increase the size for this group to get rid of more pieces so so hopefully you will agree with me that uh, with this blast this looks a little bit more uh, natural so again one other thing that we can do here is inside this stretch we are stretching this but we can also introduce a little bit of noise as well let's uh, copy this geometry global parameters here and I will drop down a turbulent noise 
right click and promote all of the input parameters and I will simply add this to the position. Okay, and I also don't need this to have any amplitude in the Z direction. So I'll drop down a multiply and I will promote this to a constant. Let's do three floats here and do one, one and zero. And let's go up and now I can select maybe, let's do sparse convolution and let's maybe increase the frequency or decrease the amplitude or let's maybe do simplex. Okay, and we probably need to add a little bit more resolution. So let's do 100 by 100. This uh, resolution that we set here will slow down your Voronoi fracture operation. So be mindful of the resolution that you set for your geometry that you want to fracture. All right, so let's go back. And I believe we actually needed to set this to a 3D noise. Okay, so if I press Shift W to view the wireframe, now I'll do a sparse convolution and maybe just get rid of some of this amplitude. All right, so this noise will now propagate over our rest and we have a lot of interesting detail for the borders of these shards. Again, we have this uh, normal artifact here and we can just drop down a normal node to fix this. So we have our shards over here. So we can see that this creates just uh, right off the bat some very natural looking glass fracturing with not a lot of nodes compared to our uh, boolean fracture method but of course you can still combine these two methods to get even more detail if necessary and from here all you would have to do is do a poly extrude and i'll just extrude this uh, let's output back as well let's do extruded front global and just push this in the z direction so maybe 0 0.1 okay so now we also have thickness for our shards and we have everything we need. Just one final problem that arises here is if you want to use the RBD connected faces nose from this, if I drop this into an RBD connected faces. So this is specifically for glass to get rid of the interior geometry here so that when you render this, it will look like it's a full glass you would have to get rid of this interior detail. Let's maybe do an exploded view from here. So like I said, in order to render this as a full glass, we don't really need this geometry here. So the RBD connected faces lets us get rid of this geometry. But by default, this node is looking for this group over here. So this group has to be called inside group in order for this to work. So if we go to our poly extrude, we can enable side group and we can rename this to inside. So now our RBD connected faces will work. And if I do an RBD disconnected faces here and I were to set this mode to delete connected, if I do the exploded view now, we can see that we get rid of our borders here. So we can render this as a full glass and we might have to adjust this distance a little bit. So we, we might have to increase this. So this is how this will work if you want to do the poly extrude after you work with a flat surface. So we can see here that for, for this poly extrude, if I were to disable this side group, now our disconnected faces and connected faces no longer work. So like I said, this is looking for a group that's called inside. So with this, I think I covered all of the methods that I usually use for fracturing. And like I said earlier, if you want to inspect this project file, I will leave you with the link for it in the description of this video. So go ahead and download it and look at everything yourself. So I hope you found this video useful and I will see you next time.